Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And I know that we have folks that are watching in on live stream, and we welcome you as well. And we're just all very grateful to come in the name of Jesus Christ and to meet and to uh, study together and learn together. What a blessed time, and especially we're, we're thankful uh, to have Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum with us this evening, and he'll be speaking to us. And I'm an anxious observer, and I'm uh, honored and privileged that, uh, that we can observe and see what's going on here. This is wonderful. It's exciting to have this uh, place set up in front of us. And, and uh, Anyway, here's some quick need-to-knows. Dr. Fruchtenbaum will be speaking, of course, tomorrow on Sunday at 9.30 and then 10.45 a.m. And 9.30, we'll have the second part of this Passover meal uh, presented, and that will be very important. So you only get a, a half tonight, okay? So you need to be sure that you're, if you're online that you need to tune in tomorrow morning at 9.30. At 10.45, there will be three related events from a Jewish biblical Christian perspective, the Lord's Table, the results of the death of Messiah, and the ascension of Messiah, all wonderful topics. Tomorrow there, there will be a nursery provided and uh, at both services. And uh, just so you'll know here, anybody, that opposite the restrooms, there's a room there that we call the overflow room, and it has audio and video in it. So for some reason you had to leave the auditorium, you can go in there and not miss anything. Aerial Ministries, of which Dr. is founder, is loaded with resources on their website, and we encourage you to take advantage of that. And then with us tonight, of course, back in the fellowship area are two book tables full of books, most of which were written by the, by the doctor. And uh, we encourage you after the service today, tomorrow, before the service, or in, in the break in between the, the two services, to take advantage uh, of those publications, some of which are even free, and uh, that are there, uh, some very good, very good information, of course, in all of that. Giving to Aerial Ministries tonight, if you want to, you can use the the offertory box that's back there by the door, the wooden box with a slot in it, and uh, and, and even tomorrow you can use that if you want, uh, just so you mark your your payment uh, to, to make sure that it goes to Aerial Ministries. But he's also, I think, going to show you another way uh, with uh, the little brochure that, that uh, I think everybody has, or maybe they don't. Do we still have the brochure? Okay, they're available, and uh, there may be some information there that you want. At the end of the service tomorrow, the later service, Thank you, thank you. Uh, at the end of the later service tomorrow, we will be passing a love offering for Ariel Ministries and for Dr. Arnold, and uh, you're, you're, we would encourage you to participate in that, of course. At the close of, of our time together tonight, uh, Dr. Arnold has agreed to answer questions again, and so if you have a question and you're storing that up, that'll be the time to, uh, to do that. And uh, at the end of the service, you also could feel free to come up here and look at the items on this table. Please do not remove or change their location, as they will also be used in tomorrow's early service. Now, Dr. Fruchtenbaum's life is an amazing story. He was born in early, well, 1943, Siberia, Russia. And at the time, his Jewish father had been falsely accused of being a, a, a Nazi spy and was imprisoned. And after his father was released with the help of the Israeli underground in 1947, his family escaped from behind the Iron Curtain to Germany, where they were confined to British camps, and then they em integrated, immigrated to New York in 1951. And he there made contact with a Christian minister who led him and his mother, and it was through the ABMJ, which is the American Board of Missions to the Jews, uh, so that at the age of 13, Arnold was brought under conviction and had faith 
And, can, and of course, that faith has grown and continues to, to be present in Jesus as the Messiah. His, fa his father opposed all of this, and the family moved to Los Angeles, and he was forbidden to read the Bible, uh, to attend Christian meetings or associate with Christian groups. And, but he continued his faith and his walk as best he could, and uh, there will be more about this uh, tomorrow. And I even mentioned this to you, that there is a biography book back there on that table about Dr. Arnold's life, and uh, I haven't read it. I think I'm going to have to get me one of those. But we are very privileged to have this special man speak to us, give us things from a Jewish perspective. God chose Israel to be his spokesman, to give us the, the Messiah, to give us the Word of God. And I personally believe that he's not through with Israel. That's what the Word says. <laughs> and, and so it is wonderful to have that knowledge and, and given to us in a special way, I think, from somebody that has firsthand experience also in that regard. So let me pray, and then we'll, we'll ask the doctor to come and teach us. Father, we thank you that we can be here. We thank you that we can yet meet in freedom and that your mercies to us are continuous as we can study and look into your precious word together as we can learn, Father, from one another, and iron sharpens iron, and we pray that we might have our hearts engaged and our minds engaged tonight in the things that are taught to us. Please be with Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Speak through him. Help him, Father, and help us to listen and hear and take in to our heart that we might be better equipped have more love for you, better equipped to serve you, better understanding of your precious word and truth. And all of this, Father, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please come. Are we on? Okay. We're going to be studying in this evening session, um, at least part of it, and then we'll finish up in the first hour tomorrow morning, is um, the most important feast in the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is divided between feasts and the fasts. The most important fast is the Day of Atonement fast, but the most important feast is the one we shall be dealing with. And these little items you see on the table all have certain meanings and certain significances from a Jewish uh, view, but also a New Testament view with the addition of the Messianic implications. Now, before we begin to the deal with the demonstration itself, let me begin by providing four basic reasons why this is something important for all believers to know, not merely Jewish believers, but all believers to know. And the first major reason is to come to understand the person and the work of the Messiah in a deeper way. To know, to know the person and the work of the Messiah in a deeper way. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse uh, 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Don't you not the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven that she may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Now, Paul is writing this to primarily a Gentile church. It had a couple of Jewish families, but it was primarily a Gentile church. But even to these Gentile believers, he says that uh, purge out the old leaven. What leaven means in this context, we'll deal with it a bit later. And the reason to purge out the leaven is because Christ, because Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Now, to understand what uh, Paul was referring to, go back a few years earlier to the work of John the Baptist. And the calling of John was to be the one to introduce the Jewish people, to introduce the Messiah to Jewish people. When that uh, day came, he could have used a number of different uh, unique uh, introductions. He could have said, this is the Messiah, this is the son of David, and so on. He does not use any of those familiar um, messianic titles. He simply says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. The Jewish audience heard this phrase, Lamb of God, they would think of two, two concepts. The Passover Lamb of Exodus chapter 12 and the, Pas and the Messianic Lamb of Isaiah chapter 53. Now to understand what both those men had in mind, we go back centuries earlier to the context of the book of Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, God told Moses to tell the Jewish people to take a lamb without spot, without blemish, and to kill it by the shedding of blood. But then they were to take the blood and place it on the three points of the doorways, on the lintel and the two side posts. Every Jewish home that night had three blood spots here, 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 which had the basic shape of a cross. And then they were to enclose themselves into their homes and partake of the first Passover. And while they're partaking of it, the angel of death will pass through the land of Egypt. When he came to a Jewish home and saw the blood protecting it, he would pass over the Jewish home. That's how the name for this feast originates, the passing over. When he came to Egyptian home and saw no blood protecting it, in place of passing over, he would pass through. As he passed through, he would slay the firstborn son of every Egyptian family. But the Jewish firstborn was spared, not because they were Jews, but because the blood of a lamb had been shed. If they merely shed the blood and did nothing more with it, the Jewish firstborn will still not escape, because following the shedding of blood, there must be the application of the blood until the blood was put on the lintel and the two doorposts. The firstborn Jewish sons were of equal danger as the Egyptian firstborn sons. And so, Paul writes, Messiah, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. So when he died on the cross, he shed his blood for everyone for the whole world, but merely shedding the blood and providing the blood doesn't save anyone. That's only the first step. The second step is that one must, one must apply the blood, and we accept him as our final sacrifice, Passover lamb. We have his blood, so to speak, sprinkled upon the doorposts of our hearts. And so when judgment day comes, um, the blood of Messiah will protect us from any judgment from the divine side, but those not protected will have to suffer for all eternity in the lake of fire. There's one major benefit for a study of this festival to get a greater appreciation for both the person and the work of the Messiah. A second major um, emphasis is to appreciate the communion service in a deeper way. And when he instituted the um, Passover observance for us to keep until he returns, he focused on two elements, the unleavened bread and the wine, and identified these two elements with his body and with his blood, and commanded us to keep this segment of the Passover, not the whole Passover, it's fine to do so, but what we are commanded to do as the body of the Messiah is to remember the bread and remember the wine. And let's go through this um, uh, elements today, we'll see exactly when did he say, this is my body, which is broken for you, exactly when did he say, this is the blood of the new covenant, and we see how these elements fit within the entire realm of the Jewish Passover, we'll have a greater appreciation to um, understand what the communion service is supposed to mean when we partake of it uh, in our regular church services, as often as the church chooses to do so. A third benefit is um, to have a greater appreciation for the element of Jewish evangelism. Now, most Jewish people today are quite secular. Uh, of the Jewish community, both in Israel and here in America, about 80% would identify themselves either as atheistic or agnostic. Only 20% identified themselves with Orthodox Judaism and believe um, in all of the events of the Passover and so on. Now, 
by the time we finish this uh, evening and, to, and tomorrow morning, you'll have a greater knowledge of these elements of the Passover. Next time God gives you the opportunity to um, witness to a Jewish person, you can use the very common way of Jewish teaching to go from the known to the unknown. The known factor of these items you see sitting on the table, but the unknown factor is how they portray in a unique way the messiahship of, the, of Jesus, the messiahship of Yeshua. And so you'd be more equipped to be able to witness to Jewish people when you come in contact with them. Now, there's a, um, there's a story uh, that explains the secularity of the Jewish community. There's a Jewish family that moved into a new neighborhood, and their uh, neighbor, next-door neighbors was the Baptist family. And both families had the same sons the same age, so they became friends. And one day the Baptist son asked the Jewish son if he would like to go to Sunday school uh, with him on Sunday morning. The Jewish son asked his parents. The parents were a bit nervous about this, but they were very secular, not practicing Jews, didn't want to make this a big issue. So he told them, well, you can go just this one time, but when you come home, you have to tell us what they taught you, just in case we have to give you a different perspective. Well, the two boys went to the Sunday school class, so when they went to their homes, the Jewish parents took their son aside and asked them, what did they teach you in that Baptist school? And the son says, well, they taught us all about Moses. And the parents were, parents were a bit surprised. Uh, they taught you about Moses? What did they say about Moses? But what they said was that when Moses led Israel out of Egypt, the, Jewish, the Egyptian army began chasing them. What Moses did was build a pontoon bridge across the Red Sea. And the Jews ran across the pontoon, pontoon bridge. When the Egyptians tried to follow the Jews to start to kill them, Moses called for an airstrike, and the Air Force destroyed the bridge, and the Jews were saved. And the parents asked the Jewish boys, is that, is that what they taught you in the Baptist school? And the son says, well, that's not the way they really put it. If I taught you what they really said, you'd never believe it. And that portrays the Jewish community rather well today. Now, there's a fourth benefit, is to have a better understanding of certain passages of, of Scripture. Because there's certain passages which are quite familiar, but they could not really be understood without the framework of the Jewish Passover understanding. And this part we'll, we'll deal with tomorrow morning. And we'll look at four key passages, rather familiar ones. But again, it was impossible to understand what those four passages were trying to say except from the background of the Jewish Passover. And so uh, that's, for these four reasons, this is a good uh, element to understand for our own spiritual growth, our own benefit. Now, the Jewish Passover will fall around the end of March or first part of April of each year. And for the, first, for the week before the first night of Passover, the Jewish home undergoes a full-scale spring cleaning, spring cleansing. And that house is swept clean from the attic all the way down to the basement. And when everybody's relatively sure that all of the leaven, that's the purpose of all this um, cleansing, to remove the, any leaven from the house, then there's a ceremony conducted by the father and his children. This happens the night before the first night of Passover. What the father will do is go to 10 different corners of the, uh, of the house, and he'll leave some regular leavened bread in the corner. Then followed by his children, he will take a wooden spoon and a feather. With these two items, he will pick up the crumbles of leavened bread, and then dump it into a napkin and wrap the napkin up around the feather and the spoon. The next morning, which is the morning before the first night of Passover, Jewish people go outside. I grew up in the Jewish neighborhoods of Brooklyn, New York, and bonfires were already burning, and you would just burn all these items into the, um, into the fire. And that signifies that now the Jewish home has been purged of leaven, and now they are worthy to partake of the Passover, which will happen on sundown that same day. Now, why did God command the Jewish people to cleanse the homes of leaven? In Scripture, whenever leaven is used symbolically, it is always a symbol of sin. And God would not even permit the symbol of sin to be found in the house. And for that reason, they must thoroughly birch, uh, purge the homes of leaven. Getting back to a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells the Corinthians, 
purge out the leaven. In the context, he's dealing with a specific sin, one of the members was sleeping with a stepmother, and Paul now instructs the elders they must act directly. And because as a local church, they must purge out the leaven to remove the leaven from their congregation. And why? For Messiah, our sacrifice is uh, a sacrifice for us. Now, when we accept him as the final of Passover, we are born again into God's family. And once we're born again into God's family, we remain part of the family forever. However, fellowship within the family broken by sin in the believer's life. So a believer must purge his life of leaven to restore the fellowship with the Father. And the means of purging is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where we must confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by means of this manner, we purge our lives of leaven. Now, later on in 1 Corinthians 11, he deals with the um, Corinthians and how they partook of the Lord's Supper, or, and so on. And instead of seeing the meaning of it, they used it as an occasion for gluttony and drunkenness. And therefore, he, he tells them that that's why God has already disciplined them in three ways. Some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you are already dead. And therefore, they must purge these kind of issues from their congregational practice because they're totally misconstrued, misinterpreted the purpose of that service in the, law, in the meeting of the church. But, um, that, but that's what's behind all this. And so that is why you go from the purging of the literal leaven to the purging of the symbolic leaven, where we do not confess the sins we may be living in. Now, in Judaism, it's viewed as being primarily a man's religion because there are far more obligations upon the male than upon the female. It's the men who must learn the basics of the Hebrew language. It is the men who must uh, pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. It is the men who must go to synagogue every Sabbath day. For the women, these are optional, but are not mandatory. But there is one very important function in Judaism for the a woman in that she's responsible to light the candles. She does this every Friday night just before the Sabbath begins, but also um, on the first night of Passover. <sighs> Having lit the candle, she has fulfilled her major, major, major function in Judaism. Nice, easy, and simple. But before you ladies start converting to Judaism because it's so much easier and simpler, let me share with you what it means. When a Jewish woman lights the candle, she does two things. Number one, she begins the Passover service because it will not begin till the candles are lit. And secondly, she provides light for the Passover table. By the same token, another Jewish woman, Miriam or Mary, began our Passover story by giving birth to Messiah our Passover. And secondly, she has provided light. Because, uh, as he said of himself in um, John chapter 8, verse 12, John 8, 12, John chapter 9, verse 5, John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. But Miriam, Mary, is the one that produced it. Now, on this night, uh, there'll be special clothes worn, but the one who that wears them was the most special clothes would be the oldest male member of the family. That could be the father, that could be the grandfather. He will put on this long white robe called a kittle, spelled K-I-T-T-L-E, K-I-T-T-L-E. And a special hat called a mitre, M-I-T-R-E, M-I-T-R-E. Now, these clothes are symbolic of the clothing worn by the tribe of Levi during the Commonwealth of Israel. And that was true up until the year AD 70. Once the temple was destroyed, the priesthood would cease to function. Now, as most people understand, the Levites are in charge of things like the sacrificial system and so on, but actually not all Levites could do that. 
Only those Levites who were direct descendants of Aaron can become the part of the priesthood and be in charge of the sacrificial offerings and systems and so on. But those who were non aaronic priests of the tribe of Levi, God gave them a different function. They were to be the spiritual teachers of Israel. Back in those days, it was not possible for every family to have a copy of Scripture. That would not be possible till the invention of the printing press. And therefore, God assigned the tribe of Levi to maintain the text, meaning making new copies of scrolls that began to be getting too old and worn out, but then secondly, to teach the content of Scripture to the other 11 tribes of Israel. So if you look at the, a map of ancient Israel that shows you where the different tribes settled, you won't find the section given to tribe of Levi. Instead, every tribe was to assign certain cities within the tribal districts to become Levitical cities. So every tribe had several Levitical cities where the Levites live in. So if you were Levites living with the tribe of Dan, you would be responsible to teach the Danite scripture. If you're living with the Reubenites, you would, you would teach the tribe of Reuben for the scriptures. They were to be the spiritual teachers of Israel. Now, on this first night, uh, the, the oldest male becomes, takes the Levitical role. He's responsible to teach everyone sitting around the table the complete story of the Passover. And he does this not extemporaneously. He does this by reading a special book called the Haggadah. And it's a, a detailed book. Sometimes it's only one language, Hebrew, sometimes like this one's bilingual, Hebrew on one side, and because this is USA, English on this side, in Germany be German, in Russia be Russian, and so on. And by reading through this book, he relates the complete story of the Passover. Now the reading of the book begins only when the youngest male child gets up to recite four questions. And regardless of the language of the country, he may be living in, he always has to do it in Hebrew. So after certain ceremonies in the beginning, he will stand up and, and sound like this. Now, for the two or three of you that may not have understood that, <laughs> here are the four questions in English. It begins with a simple question, uh, why is this night different from all other nights? And then the four questions come. And all other nights we can eat any kind of bread, leavened or unleavened. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And in summary, the answer goes like this. On the first day, uh, night of Passover, well, on the day before the night of Passover, our forefathers prepared dough for the baking of bread. Behold, before the time to leaven the dough to make it rise, order came from Moses to depart from Egypt. So our forefathers took the dough and put it on their backs and began their work out of Egypt. As he walked out, the Egyptian son baked the bread upon the backs of our forefathers. He came out flat because there was no leaven to make it rise. In remembrance of this event, we on this night partake only of unleavened bread. Second question, on all other nights we can eat any kind of herb, but on this night why only bitter herbs? And um, the answer is uh, simply because like this is a summary that um, because, uh, because we were enslaved in Egypt and because the Egyptians embittered our lives, in remembrance of that experience in Egypt, we on this night partake only of bitter herbs. And, as, and how these bitter herbs are distributed, I'll talk about later. Now the third question is, on all other nights we can eat either sitting straight up or, or reclining. But this night we all reclined, why is that? And the reason for the pillows you see on the chair is that at certain points of the ceremony, we recline towards a left-handed position. And the uh, simple answer is to remember the bitterness of slavery in the land of Egypt. Now 
Now, the last question is, then all other nights we don't dip into salt water anything that we eat. But this night we dip into salt water twice. Why is that? And the answer is that to dip twice is the symbol of the planting and the growth of a plant. And this symbolizes how God planted us a small seed in the land of Egypt, but there we grew ever multiplied. By the time we came out of Egypt, we were a mighty nation of about two million people. And so you see that the emphasis, symbol, this, of everything here is symbolic of something, but the key word, this will become important for what we'll talk about tomorrow, but the key word is always remember. We do this to remember that. We do that to remember this. The word remember is the key word for the whole Passover uh, service. Now what we have in the front, this is the Orthodox Jewish, what we call the Haggadah, the Passover book. For believers, especially Jewish believers who observe this, we put together a special Jewish um, Passover, a book, uh, which includes, uh, what you see in the Orthodox version, but what this includes is all of the messianic fulfillments, messianic significances of these various atoms as well. And this will be available from the book room as well. Now, in Judaism, whenever you come to the presence of God, you must keep your head covered. And so this night, every head is covered. The oldest male wears the hat I'm wearing at the moment, the mitre, Every woman puts on some kind of a kerchief of some kind. All the other males wear a smaller skull cap like so. And so on this night, every head is covered in keeping with that practice. If you visit a home on this night, you'll notice two things in the middle, in the center. One of these is a special Passover plate. Now, there were different shapes, different designs, different colors. So not, they don't all look the same as this. Well, but they all have the same element, six indentions. Into each indention, a special type of food or bitter herb is placed. So in the first indention, you have a mixture of apples, nuts, honey, cinnamon, and wine. Apples, nuts, honey, cinnamon and wine. Everything is chopped up small, mixed together, and it's, le it's left standing for about 24 hours, but then it will turn a deep brown color. The same color as brick mortar. And we partake of this again in remembrance of something. Remember when we were enslaved in Egypt, they made us make brick and brick mortars to build the cities of Pharaoh. The second indenture will contain stems of green parsley. And at some point, everybody will take a stem of green parsley and he will immerse it into salt water and then partake of it. Green is the symbol of spring, and spring is the symbol of youth. And this symbolizes we're just a young nation in the springtime of our nationhood. God saved us by means of the salt waters of the Red Sea. As the Jewish people came to the Red Sea, God worked a miracle, the Red Sea divided, and the Jews crossed on dry land to the other side of the shoreline. The Egyptian army tried to follow us, the walls of water caved in on them, and they were drowned. In remembrance of that event, we dip the green parsley into the salt water. And this is the first of two different dippings that I mentioned in the um, four questions a few moments earlier. The third indention contains, this is not, this is more of like a syrup bean, but it's more the fresh ground horseradish. Fresh ground horseradish. Have you taken a good table, a teaspoonful of this and swallowed in just one gulp? If you never had the experience, uh, then you're welcome to try it afterwards. If you have any sinus trouble, this will cure it and will cure it quickly. This is the Jewish answer to Dristan. And it works a whole lot faster. If you had too much of this at one time, you recall what happens. Your eyes begin to well up with water, and you begin to shed tears. We're obligated to share twice on this night, and the first shedding of tears is over the Jewish condition back then, in that while we were slaves in Egypt, we had to make, uh, we, had, we shed bitter tears over our enslavement. The fourth indention contains some more horseradish, but this time, mixed with onion, that'll help you to cry even more. 
This is for the second shedding of tears, but for a different reason. The first one is over the Jewish condition in Egypt uh, centuries ago, but this is for the present Jewish condition in that we are not yet all back in the land of Israel. If as long as there is one Jew outside the land, it means we are never truly a free people. As long as there is one Jew outside the land, there will have to be the second shedding of tears. So again, more horseradish, but this time mixed with onion. The fifth indention contains a roasted egg. And the roasted egg is dipped into the salt water and eaten, that's the second dipping. Now, when I ask to, often, uh, I'll sometimes ask in a Bible study and so on, uh, if it's a, a study, study of Gentile believers, what do you think Jewish people eat on this night? And the common answer is, well, they must eat lamb because that's what people remember from the Passover story. And back then, that was the truth, that was the correct answer. But be, when the temple is destroyed, and because the lamb is a sacrificial animal and there's no temple to sacrifice, lamb was removed from the Jewish Passover. And in place of it, there is a substitute meat. And in most cases, it is roasted chicken. In some more liberal Jewish home, it is sometimes prepared by uh, Rabbi Sanders. <laughs> so you'll be slow on that one. <laughs> but so the chicken has been, I mean, uh, the lamb has been removed and chicken has replaced it. And so we remember the lamb by the roasted egg. And we eat some other kind of meat. And in most Jewish homes, that's usually, if they're, if they're um, orthodox, they'll be roasted chicken. If they're less orthodox, they may uh, do any kind, some other kind of meat or some other kind of chicken. But notice that there's been a substitution. The lamb has been removed and replaced by another kind of meat. And what has been done physically, literally, has also been done symbolically because when, they, when Jesus was rejected as this was Messiah, that is when they rejected biblical Judaism and it was replaced by rabbinic Judaism. And part of the message that we have in Jewish missions is to tell the Jewish people, we need to go back to the authentic. We need to go back to the biblical Judaism as it has been fulfilled in the messiahship of Jesus. And when we do the Passover, we do have roasted lamb because um, he is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Nobody ever called him the chicken of God. He was called the lamb of God. And that's the emphasis we make in our Passover services every year. Now the sixth item is something nobody eats, the shank bone of a lamb. As I mentioned, they don't eat lamb anymore. So remember, to remember the Passover lamb, there was a shank bone on the Passover plate as remembrance of what they used to eat at Passover. Now, we need to keep in mind there are th uh, the difference between the first night of Passover and the first day of Passover. The Jewish day never begins at midnight, as in Gentile reckoning. It always ha happens in sundown. So it's not correct to say simply Saturday is the Sabbath. Saturday actually begins Friday evening. And it ends Saturday evening. Saturday night is still Saturday, but no longer the Sabbath. So it's from evening to evening. That is the way of Jewish reckoning of time. So the first night of something will come before the first day of something. And the first night of Passover comes before the first day of Passover. And the first night of Passover is when Jewish families will partake of the Passover meal, as I'm explaining it here. And it's not just these ceremonial islands, because in between all this, there is a three or four hour full scale four course meal to be eaten. Uh, and a lot of discussion goes on and so on. But that happens on the first night of Passover. The next morning is the first day of Passover, and the sacrifice is offered up at 9 o'clock in the morning of the first day of Passover. And from that lamb, only 25 men partake, the one, the one high priest and the 24 chief priests, in the afternoon of the first day of Passover, to partake of the Passover lamb. And... Um, so what we should notice, there's the Passover meal for all the Jewish families and the first night of Passover, and then the Passover sacrificial meal partaken by the priesthood uh, the next day at, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And the messianic significance of all this, so we'll get into that only tomorrow uh, morning. 
As I mentioned, there are two items on the table. The first one is this, and the second item is a special Passover bag. Now again, there's different shapes and designs. This one is round, sometimes it's squared, and there are different colors, different designs, but they all have the same thing in common. It's only one bag, but it's one bag that has three compartments. Into each compartment, a loaf of bread is placed. So what you have in the one bag are three loaves of unleavened bread, which bread is separated from the other by a single sheet. And this goes to a special ceremony, which is the central ceremony of the entire Passover observance. And uh, what is interesting is that while the rabbinic writings could give you detailed explanations of all these items that I've talked about so far and what I'll talk about afterwards, they, not, they don't have any explanation for this one bag with three compartments. They have no explanation for the ceremony that's going to be conducted. I'll show you the ceremony in a minute. And that is, uh, goes against rabbinic character. I would like to add a lot of elements, a lot of traditions, a lot of symbols. When it comes to this one, there's a silence element. They don't have an answer for this. Now, when it's time to begin the ceremony, at some point, the one who officiates will take out the middle loaf. And only he does the ceremony the one that leads the Passover service. Now, for this to qualify to be the Passover bread, there must meet three requirements. Number one, as we said, it must be unleavened. And keep in mind, when Messiah said, this is my body, he did not say it of the wafers that some churches use, or regular leavened bread other churches used. He only said this of the Passover bread. And there are three requirements. First one is unleavened. And again, the leaven is a symbol of sin. And the body of the Messiah was also unleavened. It was sinless. Had he committed even one minor sin, he would have been disqualified for being the final sacrifice for us. But he's the only Jew that lived that kept the Mosaic law perfectly in the 613 commandments applicable to him. So he had an unleavened, sinless body. Secondly, if you look close, notice it has stripes. If these stripes were missing, it could not be eaten at the Jewish Passover. And the body of Messiah was also striped by way of the Roman whip when he was scourged. And then it also had to be pierced. And notice if you go to the light, you can see light through it. If these holes were missing, it would be disqualified from the Jewish Passover. So bread had to be unleavened, striped, and pierced. Otherwise, you couldn't use it. So in the central ceremony, he will break in half. He will then take half of it. He'll wrap it up in linen cloth, and it must be linen cloth. He will then hide it somewhere for a while. Not necessarily here, but somewhere around the house it has to be hidden. And then that's when they, surely this is followed by the four-course meal and so on and so on. Then at the end, they will uh, find the missing loaf, unwrap it, and distribute it to everyone around the table. And each one gets a piece of unleavened bread, and so on. Now, later on in doing the dinner, the other loaves are taken out, but this is the only one that, that's taken out ceremonially. It's the only one that has any meaning. But again, the rabbis don't have an explanation. The best they do is that, that the three loaves represent the three, uh, the three classes of the house of Israel. That is the, the priesthood, the Levites, and the rest of all Israel. The priest, the Levites, and all Israel. That's as close as they come. They don't explain why the middle one is taken one out, no explanation why it is broken, no explanation for why it's wrapped up and hidden away, and why later on it's, un, uh, it's found again and opened up in connection with the third of the four cups. This is um, the, the significance, uh, the mystery, the rabbinic writings. They have no explanation for this. 
when the Jew comes to the Messiah, then he recognizes exactly the significance of it. I'll talk about one more thing, and then we'll stop, and then we'll finish up the study on it tomorrow morning. But during the course of this uh, Passover supper, Passover dinner, it lasts for about four or five hours from beginning to end, everybody will partake of four different cups of wine. Each cup has its own name. The first cup is called the cup of blessing or thanksgiving. And with this cup, uh, after, which is drunk right after the lighting of the candles, the ceremony officially begins. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. And that is drunk only after all the ceremonies have been completed. And before anyone can partake of the second cup, he must spill out ten drops. As he calls as the drops spill, he must also call out the names of the ten plagues. Only after all ten plagues have been uh, stated and all drops spilled out, can they partake of the second cup. The reason the rabbis give is this. The drinking of wine is a symbol of joy, but Jews are prohibited to be joyful over the misfortunes of others, even if those others happen to be our worst enemies. So to avoid partaking of the fullness of joy, ten drops are spilled before the second cup can be partaken of. It's a sign of mourning on behalf of the Egyptian firstborn sons. Now, as soon as you finish with dinner comes the third cup, and it's called the cup of the redemption. In Judaism, it symbolizes the redemption of the firstborn son as a result of the application of the blood. That's what it signifies. And that has a very deeper meaning, but we'll get to that tomorrow morning. And the fourth cup is called the cup of praise. It comes to the very end of the service, and then the certain praise psalms, which are sung from the book of Psalms, and then Passover is almost, but not quite finished. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go with this for uh, tonight. And uh, just so you know, it, uh, one of the books at the, at the book table in the fellowship hall is this one. It's called The Feasts and the Fasts of Israel, includes the Passover. Gives a lot more information that I gave you here, but also it has deals with all the other Jewish festivals, both mosaic, non mosaic, and also the other feasts that are, are, are talked about. And so this is a book that will be available from the back table. If you want only the Passover study, there's also a manuscript that will cover what I've talked. The manuscript, again, covers more than what I, what I would have time to cover from uh, the behind the table, but this is the. Um, manuscript that you can also get from the uh, back room as well. All right. Now I'll open the floor for questions for about 10 minutes. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll go from there. Who's got the first question? Yes. 